Colossians chapter 1 will be our starting place this morning. Nine stops to make in our Bible. Colossians chapter number 1. Colossians chapter 1. My, my goal in life is to see everyone who's not saved come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior and to see everyone who is saved allow Jesus Christ to have His way in their life and Sometimes you have to urge those who have a profession of Christianity but no evident possession of Christianity to examine themselves. Amen. Necessary, necessary. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1 verse number 3, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. People are saved when they put their faith in Christ Jesus. Christ died for our sins, was buried and the third day rose again. Christ paid the penalty for all of our transgressions against the Holy God. And the Lord is not asking you to bring something to Him in order for you to be saved. He's asking you to receive what He has brought to you. And that is the salvation that he offers in his son. So, so the apostle here, writing on this place of the Holy Spirit, says we are thankful. We are thankful to God for every one of you who has put faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all saints for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of truth of the gospel which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you, since they heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. So let, let's state this very, very clearly from this passage, and prove it from many other passages in the Bible. Salvation is by grace. It is the gift of God. It is not earned. It is not merited. It is not deserved. Your works cannot save you. That's a fact. God's grace does not save you until you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is available as a gift of God to all who believe, but only to those who believe. And that's, that's why the gospel message goes forth. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You're, you're not saved without believing. You are saved when you believe. Now, the third thing that is stated in these verses, unmistakably, is that everywhere in the world the gospel is believed, it bringeth forth fruit. There is, there is no, nothing in Scripture about someone believing the gospel, being saved by the grace of God, and not producing, not bearing the fruits thereof in their lives. So no one is asking, no one is teaching that you believe or that you prove that you have been saved by your good works. But it is unfair for you to ask anyone to believe that you have been saved if there are no good works. And that is, that is a biblical teaching and we want to, to explore that and develop that this morning. Heavenly Father, help me to speak the truth of your word Help the people that have come today to be willing to believe and receive the truth from your word. And we'll, we'll give you the honor and the glory for it in Jesus' name. And amen. Come to Genesis chapter number 1. Way, way, way back at the start of your Bible. Genesis chapter number 1. There, if you're visiting with us, we turn uh, to the pages in the Bible because too many people have been misled by men in pulpits telling them the Bible says something that it does not say. And we want you to see that the Bible does indeed say what we are telling you the Bible says. God the Creator um, took the elements that He made, according to uh, 2 Peter, and formed and fashioned them into the world that now is in six literal days from Genesis chapter 1 verse 3 down through verse number 31. And the Bible says in verse number 9, Genesis 1, 9, God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place. Let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth. A lot of controversy today about the earth. And it's because people don't read the first chapter of the Bible. 
there's a planet Earth, and there's the dry land on the planet. And the planet is called Earth, and the dry land is called the Earth. And if you don't distinguish between the two, you'll take things that God says in the Bible about the dry land and try to make them things that God says about the planet, and they're not. Two different, two different things, same name, same name. All right, so look at the verse number 11. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, and the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Now, this is, this is going to be real, uh, real in-depth scientific information. People say, I don't like science. I'm a scientist. Uh, and so I'm going to give you some scientific information right now. The seed of a tomato, when fruit is produced by that seed, it will be a tomato. The seed of an apple, when it produces fruit, it will produce apples. Apple seeds do not produce corn. Tomato seeds do not produce cucumbers. That's science. So here's what the Lord says. If, 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 a, if a papaya tree called itself a blueberry bush, it's not. Okay? If, if, a, if a vine of green beans said, no, we're not green beans, we're grapes, it's not. Now, now wait a minute. Uh, you, your country right now, your country is so far from the Word of God, that people who bear only the scientific, provable, verifiable characteristics of a male want you to pretend that they are females. And people whose genetics, whose phys uh, physical makeup, whose bone density, everything about them is female want you to agree with them that they are a male. And you say, well, those people are really, really uh, something's the matter with them. Well, wait, there was a problem long before the transgender movement. It's people who live like the devil and say they're Christians. It's people whose every characteristic of their life cries out, I don't know the Lord wanting you to pretend that they're a child of God because they say so. Well, you were all ready to get behind me when I was going after that, that <laughs> transgender crowd. Do you not suppose that someone who is born again of incorruptible seed, which is the Word of God, someone who is a child of God, wouldn't from the very first chapter of your Bible, wouldn't you expect that the fruit of that life would be something akin to Jesus Christ? Not something akin to Hollywood or a gang or somebody that never read a Bible? What a thing is can be known by the fruit that is produced by that thing. In our nation, they do these polls, and they say 53%, 57%, 65% of people in America say they're Christians. Where? In what way? By what definition? According to what observable fruit? Look in your Bible in John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I don't, I don't like this kind of talk. You should like this kind of talk. You, you should... You should like this kind of talk. It's, it's helpful. It is helpful. Because I, one of the problems you have when you go out witnessing to people is they say, oh, I don't, I don't want to be a Christian. I know Christians and they live terrible lives. You don't know Christians who they live terrible lives. Well, I, I, I knew a Christian one time. He did this awful thing to me. You didn't know a Christian. You knew someone who claimed to be a Christian with no evidence of being a Christian and he believed he was a Christian, and you believed he was a Christian, and now everybody involved has a bad attitude about Christians. 
Amen. Here's a guy eating Brussels sprouts, and somebody, somebody told him they're ice cream. And he doesn't like them, and, and he goes to the, to the restaurant, and the waitress says, would you like some ice cream? Oh, no, I hate ice cream. I've tried ice cream. I hate ice cream. He's never had ice cream. He had Brussels sprouts. Somebody told him it was ice cream. He was misled. I run into people all the time. Oh, no, I don't, want, no, no, I don't want anything to do with Christians. I've known some Christians. They were awful people. Then you didn't know Christians. You knew people who claimed something they didn't possess. Too much of that. John chapter 15, Jesus says, I am the true vine. My father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth that it may bring forth more, more fruit. Verse 4, abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. Verse number 8, herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Now, we, we haven't got to the, the description yet of the fruit. But if, if you are a branch, and Jesus Christ is the vine, what is produced in your life will not be contrary to the root and contrary to the vine. It will be in accord with the root and in accord with the vine. And too many people look at their lives and look in the mirror and don't see anything at all that's like Jesus Christ and then get offended when you tell them they need Jesus Christ. Who are you to judge me? Everybody judges. I don't, they got this thing now where, where you pay somebody to go and, and get your groceries for you. If you want, if you'll do that, help yourself. I'm not sure I want somebody else picking out my veggies and my fruits for me. What if the company was forced to hire someone who's a man, who thinks he's a woman, what if he thinks a banana's a watermelon? What, what, if he, what if he thinks cabbage is squash? I want someone who is capable of judging. Because, you understand? You have to judge. You imagine you walk in the produce aisle and there's a guy standing there. He's not handing out masks. We got past that. He's handing out blindfolds. Why are you handing out blindfolds? Well, we don't want you to judge the produce. We, we, this is a no judging zone. I don't want rotten tomatoes. I don't want bananas so green they'll bounce if you drop them. I don't, I don't want to. I want, I want to look and make certain that I'm getting... I don't want to go by the sign. I want to, if it says tomatoes, you know, somebody may have put peppers there and the sign says tomatoes. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to exercise judgment. Why? Because, well, it's just how life's supposed to go. And forgive us if we're out knocking on doors or on a, in a marketplace handing out gospel tracts and we see someone whose life is characteristic of an ungodly heathen. And they say, I don't need that, I'm a Christian. Sorry, the label doesn't match what's on the shelf. Sorry, somebody's got the ID card in the wrong place. I'm not trying to hurt you, I'm trying to help you. Matthew chapter number 6, take a look. Matthew chapter 6. I just don't think we should judge people. Stop judging me. <laughs> That's the funniest thing. I'm judging you because you judged people. You judge people all the time. You get behind the wheel of the car. Look at that idiot. You don't actually know he's an idiot. You're just... You drew that conclusion based upon the fact that he made you slow down. That's... Matthew chapter 7, verse number 15, beware of false prophets. Matthew 7, 15, beware of false prophets. How could you beware of false prophets if you just took, <laughs> took everyone at their word? Somebody's not telling the truth. And they're, they're, they're 
They're a prophet. They're, they're claiming to speak on God's behalf, but they're not speaking the truth. You know what? That requires some judgment on your part. We are false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing. They look like a sheep. But inwardly, they are ravening wolves. Now, again, I don't know, we, we, we're not supposed to... We're not supposed to use our brains anymore. That's, that's what we keep being told by, by, by Hollywood and the news media. Don't use your brains. Your brains are offensive. To people who use their brains are offensive. But we're going to use our brains for a minute. How many of you, if, I, if we, we don't do PowerPoint because it, you get enough video screen in your life, it's time to listen to a human being who's actually... Uh, uh, in, anyway. <laughs> if I showed you a picture of a wolf and a picture of a sheep... I, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping all of you would recognize the difference. What if I put a wool blanket on the back of the wolf? Look, you have to be willing. You have to be willing to be deceived. Even with a wool blanket on, a wolf doesn't look like a sheep. You understand? Now... How could a false prophet deceive someone who claims to be a Christian and has a Bible? Because they want to be deceived. You can't spend any time with the Bible and not know the difference between someone who is presenting a false Christ to you and the Jesus Christ of the Bible. You can't spend any, any time under Bible preaching and not know the difference between the Word of God and philosophy and humanism. So it's not, that, it's not that the wolf what did such a masterful job of disguising himself that people thought he was a sheep. No, he snuck in because the people who were supposed to be guarding the flock weren't paying attention. Verse 16. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Guess where you get grapes from? Grape vines. Guess where you get figs from? A fig tree. Guess where you don't get thistles? On a grape vine or a fig tree. You know what that is? That's science in the Bible. The Bible's a very scientific book. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth, corrupt, uh, bring forth evil fruit. Verse number 20, wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Now, look, let me help you. I'm, I'm trying to help you. Can I help you this morning? The people, I, I, can, I can line up a thousand people who had an alcohol problem and got saved. And Jesus changed their life. And now they don't have an alcohol problem. Why would you be offended if you can't conquer your alcohol problem and I'm telling you Jesus Christ could save you? I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm trying to rescue you. Amen. And if you made a profession of faith that didn't produce any fruit in your life, stop trusting your profession of faith and get some real faith. We're being asked today to believe that people can read God's word, thou shall not steal, and they're thieves, and thou shall not commit adultery, and they commit adultery, and thou shall not bear false witness, and they lie all day long, and we're supposed to believe they're Christians who are just struggling a little bit. You know what the Lord told me? Stop letting wolves tell you they're sheep. Got the legs of a wolf, the tail of a wolf, the eyes of a wolf, the mouth of the wolf, the teeth of a wolf. It's a wolf. Even if it puts a wool blanket on. And if the fruit of my life was all contrary to Christianity, why would I keep kidding myself and saying I'm a Christian when what I need is Jesus Christ? Not to convince you I'm a Christian so you'll stop telling me about Jesus. I don't get it. Here's another thing I don't understand. Um, I, I, I never in my life did I have any desire um, to be a, a ballerina. 
Never, I just never, never, never. <laughs> never wanted to be a ballerina. But if I came in here this morning and I had the, had the you know, the, the leotard on. Not the tutu. I'm not one of those ballerinas. You know. And I'm walk, walking on my, on my toes and stuff, you know, and I'm, and I, I said, no, 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 I, I don't want to be a ballerina. I just, I want to dress like a ballerina, and I want to act like a ballerina, and I want to watch ballet, and I want to hang out with ballerinas, and I, I, how I'm living and what I'm saying, they don't match. Here's what I don't get. If I want to live in sin, and I want to live in rebellion against the Bible, and I want to live contrary to the teaching of Jesus Christ, why do I want to say I'm a Christian? Why do I want people to think I'm a Christian? I don't get it. Why do you want me to believe you're something that you don't like? Why do you want me to believe you're something you're not interested in? Why do you want me to believe you're something that you don't agree with? It's the strangest thing. Well, I'm a Christian, don't judge me. You're a Christian, you stole a man's wife. You're a Christian, you won't pay your bills. You're a Christian, we can't even get you in the church house. Why would you want to call yourself a Christian? It's odd, isn't it? Amen. We want you to be a Christian. Right. And you don't become a Christian by doing good works. But if all we see is thistles... We're not mean-spirited to say, I think I'm looking at a thistle. And if there's never any figs, it's not mean-spirited to say, I don't think I'm looking at a fig tree. Is that we, we okay? All right, let's, Romans chapter 6. Let's try this. Romans chapter number 6. So don't leave it up to me to, to invent the fruits produced by Christ living in someone's life. Let's have a look. Romans chapter 6, verse number 20. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Okay, here's, here's my question for you. I have no one in mind. I'm not picking on him. I'm not preaching this morning. Oh, well, somebody did something, set him off. No, we're teaching through the book of Colossians, and here we are. But if you were, if you were a drug addict, a drunkard, a thief, a liar, uh, living, living it, it, with someone outside the, the, the bonds of marriage and so forth, and you said, on January the 3rd, I said this prayer, and I became a Christian. Why are you still bragging about your sin, and wanting me to be accepting of your sin, and wanting a church to change this doctrine so you can continue in your sin and call yourself a Christian? The Bible says there is fruit of a life where someone doesn't know Jesus Christ, and when they come to know Jesus Christ, they are immediately ashamed of the life they were living. And this modern business, these men standing in pulpits with, with, uh, with a wool blanket over them, telling you not to be ashamed of sin, and not to let anybody judge you for your sin, you're a Christian, based on what? Romans chapter 6, verse 22 says, But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So here's what we want to know. I know, I know there's, there's a little time getting out of the fog, and I know there's, there's a little time uh, getting oriented and, and learning your Bible. Here's all I want to know. I don't want to know what day you said a prayer. I don't want to know what day you walked an aisle. I want to know what day the things that were being produced in your life changed from things Christians are ashamed of to holiness that honors the Lord. 
When did that take place? And I'm, I'm just really concerned about these 50 and 60 percent of Americans who say they're Christians and they're not ashamed to be practicing sins that the Bible condemns. And they have no interest in producing in their lives the good fruits that Jesus Christ produces when he moves in. I, I'm not saying this to, to condemn anyone. I'm saying this because I'm genuinely concerned that people have been deceived by parents or ministers or themselves into thinking they're Christians when there's no evidence in their life to support it. Galatians chapter number 5. Galatians chapter 5. All of these prison epistles written by the Apostle Paul, recorded by the Holy Spirit, address this topic. Must be important. Galatians 5, verse number 19. The, these, are the, these are the works of the former life of which one should now be ashamed. Works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. I, I said, and I wasn't the only one, obviously, thousands of preachers said 30 years ago, however long it was, we, a prior generation saw what bringing television into every home did to the spiritual condition of our nation. And then we saw what bringing cable television in the home did to our society. And we all said, with the advent of the internet, this country will be an, an indescribable sewer in one generation. And you are, you are now being asked to believe that people who were involved in every variety, normal and abnormal, of sexual sin are Christians. And that churches should embrace them and even ordain them. You know what the Lord said? It's not Christianity. It's not Christianity. Those are things people become ashamed of once they trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. Not brag about, not push pressure on their family, their church, their ministers to accept them. We do. We accept you for what you are, a sinner who needs Christ. We don't hate you. We don't persecute you. We don't want you in a concentration camp. We don't, we don't want to throw rocks at you or throw you off buildings. We just want you to not mess with children. Not mess with your neighbor's wife. Not, not expect to be, to be a, a, a church to change what God said about marriage because you have a different idea about it. So, boy, you're going to make a lot of enemies talking that way. God help me. If I stand in this pulpit 40 years and die and haven't made any enemies. I'm not trying to make enemies, but if you're against God's holy word, the Bible, we're not going to get along so well. What else we got here? Oh, we got uh, witchcraft, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. You know what that is? That's things people who claim the name of Christ ought to be ashamed of. Amen. Half the people in America call themselves Christians are in a building this morning bowing down to idols and crossing themselves in front of statues. You know what the Lord said? You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You know, why, you know why a third of people who claim to be Christians don't even go to church anymore? They hate other Christians. They're bitter against other Christians. They can't get along with other Christians. Well, that's lost people on your job. It's not supposed to be the saved people on your job. Well, how are we doing? Verse number 22, but, 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 the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections of lust. Now, I didn't write this. I didn't write this. I get in a lot of trouble when I report what's written, but I didn't write this. 
He says, if you're Christ's, that's not your life, this is your life. If you're Christ, that stuff started dying the day you called on the Lord, and this new fruit began to be produced in your life. You say, you trying to talk somebody out of their salvation? You can't talk anybody out of their salvation. You can talk people, somebody out of their profession. And I'd be happy to do that. I'd be happy to do that. People come all the time and so, say, well, you know, I, I, got this, I got this friend, and he's saved, he's saved, but he... Based on what? He steals from you. He lies to you. He despises the Bible. He wants nothing to do with church. He's living with a woman he's not married to. But he told you he's saved. Well, what if I told you I was a giraffe? <laughs> oh, you, you don't look anything like a giraffe. Yeah. You don't have any of the characteristics of giraffe. How about that? Why would you not believe me when I said I was a giraffe when nothing in my life is giraffe-like? Why would you believe somebody who tells you they're a Christian when nothing in their life is Christ-like? guy told me a while back, he said, I'm a Christian. And I said, well, I'm a Muslim. He said, you're not a Muslim. I said, well, you're not a Christian. He said, how dare you say it? I said, you don't think I'm a Muslim because I don't read the Quran and I don't go to a mosque and I don't listen to an imam. So you know I'm not a Muslim because I don't do any of the things Muslims do. And that's how I know you're not a Christian. Now, how come it works one way and not the other? I'm, I'm not, you say, you're just trying to condemn people. No, the Bible says if you haven't believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're condemned already. I'm trying to get you out of that. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. This fellow is really mean. I am not mean. The fireman is not mean when he comes to get you out of the burning building. The, the lifeguard is not mean when he comes to pull you out of the riptide. The preacher is not mean when he tries to get you to examine your life in light of the Bible. And make sure that you're saved. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 8. For we were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Now, can I tell you where we're headed? You're not going to like this, and you're not going to agree with me, but I, I'm right. You, you would not have believed, if you were a preacher in the late 1950s, you would not have believed the day would come when churches would accept the idea that people living together and bringing children into the world who weren't married were Christians and belonged in church. But we got there. You would not have believed if you were preaching in the 1970s the day would come when a man who smooched with a man and a woman who smooched with a woman would not only get married and call themselves husband and husband and wife and wife, but that they would be accepted in churches as Christians, you would not have believed that. If Jesus Christ doesn't come, they're pushing right now to normalize pedophiles. So oh, they'd never do that. You didn't think they'd ever do what they've done. And that's why the last few preachers God has left have to preach like this. You were darkness, now you're light. If you're in the darkness and you say you're in the light, the God tells us to say to you, prove it. And the way you prove it is get out of the darkness and into the light and express your shame at ever having been in the darkness. That's what the Bible says. 
In the Bible, it's called conversion. New birth, new life, not sprinkling uh, sugar on top of the old life. Put whipped cream on garbage, it's still garbage. What the Lord wants to do is take out the garbage and give you a new life. And He will. He has the power to do it. Has the power to do it. Notice, the fruit of the Spirit is in all, verse 9, goodness and righteousness and truth. You live in a culture where everything the Bible says is wrong, the culture says it's right. And the preachers are caving into the culture. And the churches are caving into the culture. And you have people who claim to be Christians who are fighting against the teaching of the Bible, saying the Bible's not right, I am. That's not a Christian position. That's a redefining of Christianity, just like it's a redefining of gender. Everything's upside down. And we're trying to get it right side up. So we read Colossians uh, chapter 1, come, come there, come back there, Colossians chapter 1, two more stops, Colossians chapter number 1. Verse number 4, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, verse number 6, uh, which bring, uh, uh, bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth, verse 10, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. Fruitful in every good work. Let me take some of you, some of you are, are much younger than I am. Let me take you back in time, way, way, way back in time to when I was your age. If we have, had never met someone, they weren't our friend. Our friends were people we actually knew in the real world. Real friends. And if you went to school, the high school I went to, uh, 10, 11, 12, 12th grade, 1,200 students, and you who hung out together, the people who had like interests, they became friends. You had surfers who lived on the beach side. You had farmers that lived in Samsula. You had, you had sports people. You had music people. And they, and they found each other and they, and they hung out together. And they weren't just known. A person wasn't just known by who they said they were. They were identified by who they showed themselves to be, and they showed themselves to be who they were by the crowd, the group into which they fell. Who are these people who haven't been in church in 10 years and say they're Christians? Christians hang out with Christians. Who are these people who say they love the Lord and, and they've, they've read... 50, 60, 70 websites this week and haven't read 10 chapters in the Bible. What kind of love for the Lord is that? But now, now people have friends. <laughs> and they don't even know if it's a person or a robot or a psycho. It's just somebody who saw a picture and clicked a button and said, I want to be your friend. Why don't you put a picture of you at, I don't know, 6.30 in the morning? <laughs> Why is it that picture, you know? <laughs> oh, I like you. You don't even know me. Who's, who's, so look, here's my point. So somebody, somebody says, I prefer adultery to faithfulness. I prefer drug abuse to sobriety. And then they, then they go in the imaginary world of the internet and say, Hi, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian who commits adultery, and I'm a Christian who's hooked on drugs, but I've been freed from this mean, hateful, fundamental Bible preaching. I'm looking for some Christians like me 
to be my friends. I'm like you. I'm like you. I'm like you. You ain't a Christian because you found some people that are like you. You're a Christian if you're like Christ. And today, we, we're not just up against trying to protect the testimony of Jesus Christ from people who would come in and harm our churches, but from millions of people who we will never meet trying to redefine Christianity like they're redefining gender, trying to redefine Christianity like they've redefined marriage. So much so, listen, this is how far we've gone. You've got the manliest of the manly, a, a, a entirely merit-based system. It's about the last one left in America. You do not make the National Football League if you are a wimp because we need a certain percentage of wimps. You understand? You got to be good enough or you're not on the team. So these are men among men who have outdone men all their lives. And if they're told to, they celebrate men marrying men because they don't want to offend the culture. Now you know what? The last domino standing was the Christian pulpit. But since the preachers spent more time with Fox News than the Bible, and more time watching football than studying the Bible, and more time on the internet sur surfing the web than witnessing telling people about Jesus, down go the preachers. And so you've reached the place now where if someone tells you, I don't think men ought to marry men, oh, hate monger, oh, Cruel, oh, offensive, oh, throw them off the internet. And people come to church and a preacher says, your life ought to be characterized by these things that are fruits of Christianity. And if they're characterized by those things that are fruits of darkness, you need to get saved and born again. The people who claim to be, oh, hate monger, oh. Listen, you've lived to see the day. Look, now, I'm, 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 this was the norm, okay? Suit, uh, tie, uh, dress shoes, uh, Bible, uh, man's haircut, uh, pulpit, preaching. That's what everybody got when they went to church 50 years ago. Now it's, uh, what's wrong with that guy? Where'd you get that from? You didn't get it from a Bible. You didn't get it in a prayer meeting. You didn't get it out when in, when in souls. Where'd you get that from? The average church member today is 10 times more influenced by Hollywood and the media than they are the Bible in Jesus Christ. What I'm preaching this morning would offend no professing Christian in my childhood. And is offensive to almost every professing Christian in my adulthood. We've come a long way in the wrong direction. Long way in the wrong direction. Luke chapter number three. One last stop. Luke chapter number three. There's a fellow here named John the Baptist. You might have heard of him. He was a preacher. And what John the Baptist did with his preaching was prepare people's hearts to receive Jesus Christ. I think that'd be a good thing for a preacher to do, don't you? And so, Bible says in verse number 3, he came into all the country about Jordan preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Okay, so let me tip you off to something. 
say, but how long is this going to last? About 10 more minutes, maybe, maybe. Ten more. Why would God send his son to die for the sins of sinners if sinners weren't sinners who needed to repent? This modern idea that nobody needs to repent makes the cross a ridiculous act. If you don't need to repent, why is the Son of God being crucified for your sins? And when you tell people, there's really no sin, there's just hang-ups, there's really no sins, you just got an emotional problem, there's really no sin, you just, you, you're just a little different than... No, it's sin. And if you repent of that sin and come to Jesus Christ, he can deliver you from it. But if all you get is this false Christianity and this watered-down uh, preaching, you're going to be left just like you are the, throughout your life. Why do you want to stay that way? Verse number, verse number five, what's John the Baptist's job? Every valley should be filled, every mountain and hill should be brought low, and the crooked should be made straight, and the rough ways should be made smooth. John the Baptist was not sent to look at crooked things and say, oh, well, that's okay. He was sent to straighten out what was crooked. He wasn't sent to look at things that were too low and things that were too high and say, well, that's just how they are. No, he was sent to level the, the path so people could get to Jesus Christ. I got this big problem in my life. Let me help you get to Christ so he can remove that big problem in your life. I got this big pit of despair in my life. Let me help you fill in that pit of despair and get you to Christ. This modern ministry said, well, you'll always have a mountain in your life, but you're a mountain climber. <laughs> that doesn't help anybody. Verse number eight, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Every day's a Friday. Be the best you. And they just don't seem to go together. Look, if you're a generation of viper, you know who the serpent is? It's the devil. He said your first birth is no good. You need another birth. Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. You can't keep going this way. God wants to save you, but if you don't get saved, it's going to be bad news. Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance. As long as you're excusing sin, you're not coming to Christ. As long as you're blaming somebody else for your sin, you're not coming to Christ. As long as you're saying that sin is not sin, you're not coming to Christ. Lord, so we need to see some fruits of repentance here. Listen, listen, young people. Listen, I'm not, I'm not against you. Listen. Say not with, and begin not to say within ourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. So here's, here's the last thing I'm going to tell you. Then we're going to pray. All the people of the world, God picked Abraham. Abraham believed God. It was counting him for righteousness. God gave Abraham a friendship nobody else had. Covenants nobody else had. Laws and statutes nobody else had. You know what these people said? We, we must be right with God because we came from Abraham. He's our father. Well, Abraham had a relationship with God because he trusted God's word from his heart. <clears throat> Jesus said, don't tell, me, don't tell me you don't need to repent because Abraham's your father. It's not going to get you anywhere. Guess what? The fact that your parents are Christians and they're such dedicated Christians that they, they, they politely, gently, lovingly urged you to say a prayer when you were a child so they could feel good about you. I just want to know where's the fruits of your repentance. 
I just want to know where's, where's, where's the figs instead of the thistles? Where are the grapes instead of the thorns? Don't think you're going to heaven on a family plan. Don't think you're getting in on your mom's faith or your dad's faith. You got to have some. You got to have some. I'm not wishing, I'm not wishing ill on anyone. But I'm telling you right now, if I love sin more than righteousness, and I love the things of the world more than the Bible, and I love being anywhere else at church time than being in church, I wouldn't keep saying, look, look at this wool coat I've got on my back. I must be a sheep. Look at these thistles. I'm a fig tree. Look at these thorns. I'm a vine. <laughs> Look, I'm a girl. It, it's, it's not what you call yourself that counts. It's what you are. Amen. Too many people in our land calling themselves Christians. No evidence to support it. I have no one in mind. Some of you I've, I, I've, I've met the first time this morning when you walked in the door. But I'm telling you Christianity is not a profession. It's a life-changing encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ who delivers you from darkness and puts you in light. And you may still struggle with some things we all do, but you'll be ashamed of it. You won't be bragging about it. You will be repentant when you fall. You will not be asking the, the rest of the world uh, to, to accept you as a, as in, in your fallen state. God doesn't want to leave you there. He wants to lift you out of that. We're not trying to condemn you. We're trying to keep you from condemning yourself by accepting a false Christianity that leaves your life the mess it's in. When you can have a real Christianity that elevates it and makes you a great husband and a great wife and a great parent and a great child and a great friend because of the work of God in your heart and in your life. And that's what Jesus offers. And it's available to you today if you'll receive it. Heavenly Father, help us. The most serious matter in our entire lives is our relationship to Jesus Christ. I pray this morning, Lord, that every man, every woman, every boy, every girl in this place, you have searched their hearts and examined them. And Lord, where there is no fruit of righteousness, of holiness, of love, joy, peace, Lord, that people would not, not let this pass them by, but receive your words, your truth into their hearts and allow you by your, your mighty creative power to change their lives for time and for eternity. We pray in Jesus' name and amen.